hey, I'm Al McGee with Your Entertainment Ticket. I'm here with the director for the film, Uncle Peckerhead with Matthew John Lawrence. How you doing, Matthew? I'm doing great. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me, Al. All right. Well, the first question is, it's that first shot in the film. Now, was that on paper or, or how did that happen? Because that's what really captured me was that first shot with the, you know, the blood, the eyeballs and things like that. Yeah, I mean, I, I had always had that in mind. Um, I wanted to start the movie off with a bang. I know when I watch movies, especially horror movies, what I'm looking for is I'm looking for like something to immediately grab me. And I had had this, this idea of uh, the film, besides kind of the otherworldly aspect of having a, a cannibal roadie, is largely based on real experiences of being on the road because uh, both myself as well as some friends have played in bands, gone on tour. So uh -huh. I thought it would be really great to say, to open up with that title card of based on a true story, but immediately, the next thing you see is something so out out of this world and so crazy and insane and, and visceral and gross <laughs> that as soon as you see that, you're like, clearly this isn't based on a true story. But yeah, oh. I had already had that in mind, like like in one of the earlier drafts. That's something I wanted to do. Oh. Now, Uncle Prickerhead, how did you come up with that name? Um, well, the, the, the cannibal monster roadie's name is Peckerhead, and there's really like two, two different ways to look at it. Um, one is that he kind of acts as this, this uncle character in that right. he, he, there's an age difference between him and, and the group of uh, the, the band that he tours with. So he kind of takes on this, this kind of like uncle-like or this sage-like kind of older role. Um, but in all honesty, like the initial idea was coming from uh, around 2016, 2017, when when Trump uh -huh. was elected, there had been a bunch of articles talking about like the forgotten male, like the forgotten white male um, who had voted for Trump because he felt that the world had left him behind. So yeah. I thought, I, and they said these are like kind of the uncles at the Thanksgiving dinner table that are arguing with like their younger nieces and nephews. So I thought that's something I wanted to explore and explore it in a really wild horror movie, but explore this uh -huh. idea of a uh, this older guy who feels like he's kind of been left behind and he's willing to kind of destroy and completely rip apart this world um, because he feels like he's been left behind and it kind of he he has such a kind of a damaging effect on this group of of young people in in the band that he's touring with yeah that's how he felt and also he wanted to to belong with them and you're absolutely right and then uh when he finally got with them he felt so happy yeah yeah, he found that he was he was seen and he was found. And then when when it wasn't going his way, he was willing to destroy it all to kind of he was willing to destroy everyone's lives because they had kind of rejected him. Well, let's talk about David Littleton for a moment. How did you pick him to be Uncle Peckerhead? I mean, luckily, he picked us. Um, David, oh. is, uh, he's. He sent in a video, we had a casting call. We had gone through like quite a few days of casting for Peck and we hadn't found anyone that came even, even close to what I had envisioned when I was writing the script. Uh -huh. um, so really David sent in a video and he, I mean, a minute into watching that video, I was completely floored. I mean, what you see in the movie is what he sent in in that initial casting call. And it was really about getting him to kind of like come in, read for the part with the other actors and actresses, uh, Chet, Ruby, and Jeff who make up Duh. And as soon right. as we saw him with them, I mean, the chemistry was there. And it was really like, uh, he loves horror movies. He's like an amazing, as, as you, I'm sure you saw in the movie, he's an amazing actor. Um, and we were lucky enough that he really wanted to throw himself into the role and he was really game for anything that, uh, that we had in mind. Oh, that's, man, that's great. Cause I really enjoyed him, man, as Uncle Peckerhead. Uh, he really made me believe that he really was that. And also he's that even off camera. <laughs> He's amazing. I mean, like he he's like uh, off camera. He's one of the he's he's the most charming version of Peck. He's this like really uh, he's such a giving performer, but he's he's also like such a great friend. Um, and he really kind of grew close to a lot of us on set and we still kind of talk and hang out. So he's he's such a great, great person. Oh, good. Now, the name Duh for the band, is that a homage to the Simpsons? Or, or, or how did you get the name Duh? <laughs> I mean, I. 
I, I'm a gigantic Simpsons fan, but Doug, <laughs> Doug really came from, I wanted, uh, since, since the band name is uttered so much in the movie, I wanted something really easy, really memorable and really quick mm. to say, so you didn't have to kind of trip over your words every time you were, you were like naming the band or, or, or using the band's name. Um, so I, I, I hadn't really heard of a band called Duh. There are some like smaller bands that, are, that have been called Duh. So I thought it was a really great, great thing. And I, I thought it kind of embodied kind of the, the, the nihilistic kind of like spirit of the band that, that, that you find in the movie. Oh man, that's, I, I said Duh. That's <laughs> what I said, Duh. <laughs> now, now, but you label this as a comedy horror. It is funny in some spots and it is horror. Is this a new genre now that you created? Because I never really heard of a comedy horror. Yes, there's been some horror movies that was kind of funny, but they never dubbed themselves as a comedy horror film. I, I, I don't think I don't think I'm the first. There are a lot of films that really kind of inspired me. I mean, like there's movies like Shaun of the Dead that that do a really great balance of comedy and horror. I mean, Evil Dead Two is one of is one of the films that really kind of inspired me to want to become a filmmaker and also kind of informed the type of energy I like in movies. Um, so I, I don't think it's really nice to, of you to say that, um, but there are like so many films that kind of came before Uncle Peckerhead that really inspired me in, in balancing kind of real kind of visceral, horrific, gory uh, scenes and, and circumstances with uh, like really funny, hysterical, like moments of levity that can kind of help help the audience to kind of guide them along. So they're not just constantly being bombarded with, you know, like horrific moments or gore or just gross, like gross scenarios. Um, I think comedy is such a such a really nice blend uh, or such a nice kind of a compliment to horror. Um, and just for me, I mean, like being in a, being with an audience and hearing them laugh is like a drug. So that's like I always in any type of film I make, I always try to infuse some some levity, some comedy, um, just because it's so nice to hear people laugh. Yeah, I went from <laughs> to oh. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> yeah, I went through that. Now, Chet and uh, Jeff and Ruby. Man, they really played together as band members, not only that, as musicians. And the music in the film was very good. I mean, I really enjoyed listening to it. How did you put that all together? I mean, so Jeff, who plays Max in the film, who's the guitarist in Duh, uh, he's been a best friend of mine for the better part of a decade. And he's played in, in bands. He's a, he's a touring musician. That's what he does for a living um, uh, outside of working on film. So we had wanted to collaborate on a bigger project. So I had, I had come to him when I had this idea and I said, hey, like, you know, I, he had this one song that I really wanted to use called, called Trash Age, which is the last song they play in the film, in the final mm. seconds. That's the song. And he's like, yeah, like we can use that song, but how about I write like a, an entire record, like an EP of songs for this band, like original music, and, and we actually like perform it. Um, and from there it kind of took off. And luckily, um, Chet and Ruby, who played Judy and Mel, um, they had not had uh, a lot of musical experience prior to prior to the film. Um, they had, they had especially not played their instrument. Like Judy, uh, who's played by Chet Siegel, had never played the bass, and Ruby McAllister, who plays Mel, had never played the drums. But uh, we signed them up for like a month's worth of lessons. Jeff made some videos to show them how to play the songs, and they they learned the songs. Oh. You see them play in the film, they are actually playing their instrument to the music. Um, and they did a great job. They like what was so great about working with them is even though it might be scary to kind of learn an instrument in a month and actually have to play it on camera, that they mm -hmm. really threw themselves into that into that role and into that that moment. So I mean, I, I couldn't speak highly enough about them uh, for doing that. Oh, uh, they were very good, very good, believable too in the film. I really thought they were real musicians, so they were actually playing. That, yeah. that's that's great for a film. Yeah. Now, what inspired you to be a, a script writer to write stories for film? When did you get started, and and why? And why did you get started? 
I mean, I, I, I've always loved film and uh, I was actually kind of a late bloomer when it comes to studying film formally. Um, I, had, I had kind of entered into college pre-law and I kind of, I, then I was like, maybe I want to do television production. I wanted to work maybe in like, a, like, like something like The Daily Show or SNL where I actually interned. Um, but film kind of was something I'd always loved growing up, but I always felt it was like s something far away. I like oh. I always equated it with Hollywood and I had nobody in my orbit, like friends or family that worked in the industry. Um, so it wasn't until like, uh, like just a few things kind of came together and I was like, maybe I want to study it uh, for in grad school. And I started studying film and I actually, I started as a, a cinematographer. I really was into photography and I wanted to, to really kind of get into that aspect. Um, but I took a screenwriting class my first semester uh, at Boston University where I went to school to study film and I fell in love with writing. I mean, I always liked writing, but I... I'd never written like a script before. And I just, I mean, I fell in love with the idea of being able to kind of like, I, I always had like a huge imagination. I, I love coming up with ideas and stories. I love kind of like developing or, or, or collaborating with people on story ideas. Um, so this, this idea that I could think up any crazy thing in my head and put it on paper and then potentially be able to kind of make that a reality, um, you know, through the medium of film or video or whatever you want to call it. Um, it was like love at first sight that like screenwriting is my number one love, I think, in the filmmaking mm. process. Oh, man, that's great because uh, I'm a theater person myself. I have a background in that and I have my master's degree in that also. But I love film also. I really love film. Oh, that's good to hear that, man. You started in school. Now, when you approach producers, people to help you put some money together to do this and they saw that script, what was their first reaction? Um, so like in reality, like, uh, one of the main producers I worked with, Nicholas Santos, I'd been working with him for like, I would say almost 10 years too. Um, and we would basically like trade positions. Like I would direct, he would produce, and then, uh, I would produce, he would direct. Um, so in reality, like it, it wasn't really kind of tough because our movie was, uh, mostly self-funded and we had a couple of, uh, like, like, um, like small level investors that that put in some money and they were just doing it out of the kind of the kindness of their hearts and that yeah. they weren't <laughs> clearly they weren't concerned with uh with making their money back right away um but the one thing is like when especially when you have a, a trusted friend reading the script um it, it, they're it's not about trying to convince them to do it it's it's that they're you know they're already in in your corner and they really want you to help they really want to help you fully realize your vision um, that's not to say there weren't some moments in the script that they read and they're like, I don't know about this. I don't know how we're going to bring this to agents or managers of these actors or actresses and convince them to do a movie that has, you know, uh, you know, some of the, some of the scenes we have in the film are, are pretty out there and pretty wild in terms yeah. of like, you know, there's a, there's a lot of blood, there's a lot of bile, there's a lot of poop in it. Um, so, uh, I, I think it was mostly that just their concern with how is this going to kind of track with, you know, the people representing these or, or like looking after their actors or actresses or, or, or like other personnel. But luckily, I mean, everyone that we came to both, uh, cast and crew wise were so incredibly, they, they really embraced it. There were very few moments where in the script they were like, no, I don't like this or, or that doesn't suit me. Um, everyone was like super open-minded and a great collaborator in that respect. Oh, that's great. Now, here's a question that uh, I don't know how you want to answer it. I, I just really felt that this film really needs to be in the theaters, but unfortunately with our situation today. So how are you going to try to get people to go to video demand to find, to find your film? Al, so it's a great film to see, man. I'm telling you, they, they should see it. I mean, Al, you nailed you nailed it on the head. Uh, like it, it is heartbreaking because the first public screening of the film was was in public. Um, we played at Panic Fest in in January, um, and it was an absolutely it was a blast. Like people were cheering, people were gasping, people were laughing. It was like because like what, what the whole intention, uh, my whole intention of making this movie is, I wanted to make just a fun a fun like movie theater movie a movie right. that like, you know like it just like grabs the audience from that first frame and it just doesn't let up and you're just having a blast there's music there's crazy gore there's comedy there's everything 
Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's a total bummer, um, that we can't pl formally play, you know, like a, a theatrical, or we're not going to do a theatrical release, not now at least. I mean, the one thing that I, that I was really encouraged by is we played the Calgary Underground Film Festival in, I think it was in April or May, and that was, uh, it was a virtual film festival. Mm -hmm. And what they, what they did is they encouraged people to obviously with people that they lived with or they trusted or doing it socially distance outside is to have watch parties, you know, to, to invite some people over, grab your projector, put it in the backyard, you know, put it on the wall and just watch together and just hang out and enjoy the movie. And it was amazing. They were like tweeting us photos. They were like, people were sending us photos online. And it really was, it, it is the type of movie that you want to have like, you know, a couple of beers or, or, you know, some drinks. You want to hang out with your friends and you just kind of want to laugh and, and enjoy it together. So what we're doing, we're encouraging that. So the movie is going to be released on digital and VOD on Tuesday, August 11th. That's next Tuesday of this interview. And we're just encouraging people that like, whether you watch it alone or whether you, you have these watch parties, no matter what, you should like tweet about it, talk about it, post it, you know, on Instagram. And like everyone in our cast and crew like replies to those uh to those posts we talk to them so even if they're alone watching the movie they're not watching it alone because we're talking we're with them while they're oh. watching a lot of the time um so that's like how we're trying to in this in this very unprecedented time uh trying trying to give people that really want to watch our movie like the the theatrical or the film going experience where you're around a bunch of people we might not know each other, but you know we can we can still laugh and have a good time while we're watching the movie. Yeah, I had a good time watching the film, and I can't wait to come on VOD. I'm going to watch it again with some friends. Well, Matthew John Lawrence, thank you for taking time with me. I want to get your entertainment ticket. I really enjoyed the film Uncle Peckerhead, and uh, I can't wait to see what you're going to do next. Okay. Al, thank you so much for having me. It was such a blast getting to talk with you and, and take care, be well, and, uh, and stay healthy. Oh, and you stay safe, my brother. Yeah, you as well. Take care. Right. Take care. <laughs>